So how do you film yourself in a cinematic way? What camera settings do you need to use? What shots do you need to get that will make sense to the story? How do you film the whole sequence? And what camera gear do you absolutely need that is completely non-negotiable? I'm gonna answer all these questions in this video and I'm gonna go through the practical steps that I go through when I wanna film myself in a cinematic way as simply as possible, only using one camera, but making it look as though I filmed with a multi-camera setup. Depending on what it is that I'm filming, I often find that having the music selected first helps me to set the pace of the sequence and it also helps me to visualise everything as well. Not only that though, believe it or not, it helps me to know the kind of lighting that I want to set up as well as the time of day that I'll also film the video. Obviously the story plays a big part in this as well, but if the time of day or if the story isn't dependent on the time of day, then I'll use music as the deciding factor for this instead, because that also helps me to set the pace and the speed of my actions when I'm filming the shots and just moving around the scene. For my music, I like to use Artlist because the music just sounds professional and high-end. It kind of sounds like the kind of music that you'd get in a film. And because it can take a while to sometimes know what you want, selecting the mood, the genre, and the instruments really can help, but also so does the similarity feature which allows you to find tracks that are similar to the ones that you like, which helps you to really narrow down the search. So once I've found my music track, then I go from there. So when it comes to camera settings, there are three main components that I use to get that cinematic look. So starting with the first one, I tend to choose 25 FPS because it's close enough to 24 FPS, which is typically what is used in movies. So our eyes are already trained to associate that look with being cinematic. So if you typically tend to shoot with 30 FPS, then it's a good idea to try and drop that down to 24 FPS instead. I shoot in 25 FPS because I'm in Europe and it's to do with the electrical frequencies, but all the other videos that I shoot are also in 25 FPS as well. So I don't want to start mixing frame rates because I use a lot of the footage I shoot across multiple projects. Now the second camera setting is the shutter speed. So one of the other ways to get a cinematic look is to have natural looking motion blur in the shot. Anything else looks kind of jittery and just not smooth. So because I shoot in 25 FPS, I set my shutter speed to 1 50th of a second to adopt what's called the 180 degree shutter rule, which means to set your shutter to double your frame rate if you want to have that natural motion blur. And finally, the last setting is what gives me full control over the final mood and tone of the video, and that is shooting in a log colour profile. In part three of the series, which will be the next video, I'll show you how to very easily deal with log footage in the edit if it seems daunting to you or if you're a beginner, so don't worry about that. I've also linked a video in the description which gives you some tips about shooting in log because setting your white balance and your exposure correctly is quite key in getting the look right and being able to colour grade the footage properly. When it comes to camera gear, honestly, you can keep this very simple. You can use two cameras if you want to, but you can just as easily use one and get great results. And it's sometimes a lot more simple to do it with a single camera when you have no one else to help you. Ideally, your camera will have a flip out screen so that you can see yourself or you can get an external monitor. You don't need to spend a lot of money here as you just wanna be able to check that you're in focus and in the frame correctly. And having a bigger screen in order to do that does make a difference. But if you've got your computer or your laptop in the room, you could even just get a long HDMI cable and monitor yourself in the software OBS. And that's something that I tend to do sometimes. Then the next thing that you're going to need is a tripod. And if you're restricted by space, much like I am in this room, then you can use something like this round based monopod, which I have. And it's really easy and it's really quick to set up and it's really quick to just put it up and put it down to adjust the height. But also to stop you from having to touch the camera once you've already set it up, so not having to touch the record button, having a remote control is great, especially one like this that allows you to stay in position and set your focus manually from the control itself. Unless I'm 
I'm filming a talking head, I tend to use manual focus to have full control and make sure that the focus is exactly where I want it to be. But having this remote makes it easy to make sure that I'm in focus if I'm gonna be in the frame and I'm too far away from the camera to set the focus on the, on the lens itself. The next thing that I use is a shotgun mic on my camera. I have this so that I can get the natural sound effects that happen as I film. But if the camera's too far from the action and the shotgun mic's on top of the camera, or if you started filming and just the audio just didn't come out very well for the sound effects, then you can just add these later on in post. And Artlist again has a sound effects library where you can go and you can pick out the best sound effects for the action that's happening. So it's not a big deal if you don't capture it all together in the first instance. Artlist has loads of sound effects to choose from on the site and it's really easy to find what you're looking for, but I'll go into that in more detail in the next video. You could also just position a wireless mic near the action out of shot if you'd rather just capture the sound effects there and then. So that's a really good way to just get those sound effects if your shotgun mic is too far away. The next thing is lighting and lighting is one of those things that isn't necessarily my strong point and so it's one of these things that I'm constantly learning about because I've always just dealt with natural lighting just from the nature of how I got into making films via documentaries and just being outside all the time. But also in my room where I film I have quite a lot of natural light coming in so if it's a bit of a dull day then I'll tend to simulate a brighter day with my lights and I have several lights that I use. The main one has a large dome on it that creates even soft lighting, which replicates the light that comes from a window. And then I have another light, which I tend to point up at the ceiling to make the room a bit brighter in terms of the ambience. But this is something I play around with depending on how bright the day is or how bright I want it to appear based on the small window, as that's usually seen in some of the wide shots. The next thing is something that you don't necessarily need indoors, but it's definitely something that you need when you're outdoors if you apply the 180 degree shutter rule, and that is an ND filter. I tend to use variable NDs because as the light levels change, I don't have to keep swapping out filters because you can just buy them as individual strengths. But the other filters that I really like to use are mist or diffusion filters, as this softens the digital look of the image by how much depends on the strength that you get. This isn't a requirement though, this is very much personal preference and if you like that look. This whole kit by Freewell though is great because when I'm switching lenses, I don't have to unscrew filters each time. I can just unclip the system in seconds and move it from one lens to the other. And speaking of lenses, I tend to use three main ones. So I'll use a 16 to 35 millimeter or a 24 millimeter and also a 40 millimeter. Sometimes I do use an 85 too, but let's just keep it simple and stick to, let's say two. So the 16 to 35 millimeter is great for having wide to medium shots without needing to switch lenses. Then I use the 40 millimeter close focus lens by Zeiss as I can get close up shots by getting very close to the subject without needing a macro lens. And that's one of the benefits of this 40 millimeter close focusing lens. And it's one of the reasons why I use it for a lot of product shots in the videos that I do, because it just produces such great results and you can get really close to lots of detail. You might also see me using one of these. This is a V-mount battery and these just let me shoot for hours without having to worry about switching batteries all the time because obviously the smaller batteries die a lot quicker. So this is again an optional piece of kit but it's one that I just wouldn't be without anymore. With everything set up it's then just time to film and I already have a clear vision in my mind of what it is that I want to capture because I will have already planned out all the shots. And if you missed the first video I went into detail about what shots to get and how to plan out getting those shots. And that's actually a really crucial part in this whole process. So it is worth checking out that video and there's a link in the description to that. So when you film the sequence, you don't have to film every single step of the action. Viewers are intelligent enough to fill in the gaps so you don't have to spoon feed them everything but it can be good practice to shoot each step so that you have a variety of shots in the edit. But again, I talked about this in the first video. I tend to capture the entire sequence in a linear way as the action unfolds, which can be tricky if you only use one camera, but I will film all or as much of the action that I can as my main master shot, which typically tends to be a wide or medium shot. Then I'll reposition the camera 
closer to the action and repeat that same action as I did before, but just getting the close up shots and trying to maintain continuity. The other thing to consider when switching between shot sizes is to maintain the same level of speed and velocity with the movements so that it all flows and it looks seamless when I edit the two cuts together. And there's a really simple trick to doing this seamlessly in the edit and I'll show you that in my next video along with how to edit the entire sequence and add final touches to bring everything together in a cinematic sequence and I'll drop that link to the video in the description.